right, this is active filter design lecture 40. Um, in the last class we were discussing uh, the benefits of an active RC type integrator and the filters that you can build using active RC integrators. We saw that it is not strictly necessary to have an operational amplifier right, in the sense that uh, you know, as we understand it an op amp is one where the output impedance is 0. It behaves like a voltage controlled voltage source with a very, very large gain. Um, unfortunately, as we saw last time in uh, CMOS technologies, it is difficult to, to make especially in low voltage CMOS uh, to make an op amp with large DC gain as well as 0 output impedance uh, with a sufficiently large swing. It is in principle possible, but the moment you do this, all these things will be based one way or the other on the common drain amplifier. The moment you have a common drain amplifier, you are simply losing out that VTN of swing from the common drain amplifier and this therefore, uh, it is difficult to make, uh, to exploit the full range of uh, supply available, uh, which will eventually translate into excess participation to realize to have a filter with a given dynamic range. You understand? So, if your signal swing reduces, you have to reduce noise of the filter to maintain SNR. Uh, a reduction of swing by a factor of 2 means increasing power drawn or current drawn from the supply by a factor of 4 because you have to simply impedance scale the uh, network by a factor of 4 and uh, therefore, so that the noise goes down by a factor of 4 and this uh, will lead to excess power dissipation. Uh, then we realize that it is not, uh, I mean we can do away with the op amp as long as it's possible to get a transconductor GM, which is sufficiently large, where the sufficiently large is defined as this GMR being right. So, GMR must be much, much larger than 1. If this is true and if we added a small resistor in series with the capacitor where the value of this resistor is 1 by GM, then the transfer function VO by VI is minus 1 by SCR. I just put an approximate sign there, right. And the the correction factor will be 1 by 1 plus 1 by, 1 by GMR, right. So, uh, if uh, this resistor called the 0 cancelling resistor because it cancels the RHP 0 which would otherwise be present. If this resistor tracks the GM of the transconductor, then we see that what we will get is uh, is minus 1 by SCR times a correction factor which uh, will be close to 1, which uh, then, then you can argue that this uh, CR has effectively been modified by a small value, right. Yes. Pardon? No, it cannot, there can only be one pole here because there is only one capacitor. You follow? All right. So, uh, this is the, uh, um, this is where we left off on uh, Monday, okay. So, let us continue on and see, uh, you know, what else, I mean, so the bottom line is therefore, to get as large a GM as possible. Unfortunately, the GMs we saw, right, uh, we are aware of right now are one, the differential pair, the pure differential pair what is the problem with trying to use it here? Swing is just a problem, right? Because the amount of swing, uh, you can only go one threshold below the, if you want to make the input and output common modes the same, then the swing is severely limited by in a differential pair, correct? So, the next thing to do is to say, okay, I am going to try and improve the swing. So, I will use a folded cascode, right. And now, the swing, you know, at the output can go 2 delta Vs from the supply on either side, 
and therefore in principle you are able to get a large uh, swing. However, in order to get a sufficiently high GM, the only way to do it is go on burning more and more current in the in the differential plan, correct. So, there is nothing else you can do. Now, one other way of increasing the transconductance, right, is not putting GMs in parallel, but I mean increasing GM is simply putting more and more GMs in parallel so that the effective transconductance increases. Another way of doing it is take a GM, convert its output, uh, I mean push it into a resistor, make its output voltage large, use that to control another GM. So, this is cascading rather than uh, putting things in parallel. So, one thing that one might think about is to use two transconductors okay, and attempt to see if you are doing any better. All right. Now, uh, first of all, I have to flip the signs so that overall negative feedback is maintained. All right, and uh, we know that at the output of the transconductor, there will always be. I mean, ideally, you want a large multiple of GM, right? So you attempt to realize that large multiple by putting these two guys in cascade. Now, what is the equivalent short circuit current of or the Norton equivalent current of this composite transconductor that you have? Come on, please do not tell me it is GM1, GM2 because it is not even dimensionally consistent. Okay. So, we can at a pinch say that okay, the output resistance of the transistors may be assumed to be very, very large to be practically considered infinite. And if not, you can cast code and stuff like that and get the DC output impedance to be you know very, very large, but you cannot get away from parasitic capacitance. So, you let us call this uh, C P 1 and then there is C P 2, right. So, uh, what do you think? Uh, so, now what is the short circuit current looking in here? It is nothing but G M 1 by S C P 1 times G M 2 is the short circuit all right. Okay. Now, uh, does anybody see uh, any problems with this or uh, this is fine? Yeah, you have introduced a pole, uh, okay. what else? What is varying with frequency? Yeah, okay, sure. The I mean that's the same as saying you introduce a pole. It may cause instability or will cause instability. Why? Okay. So uh, in principle, this must work even if uh, to figure out that there is intuitive, I mean intuitively it is very obvious this is a problem. To realize this, please note the following. In this integrator, right, what do you think happens as I go on increasing R, will the integrator become more and more ideal or more and more non-ideal? If this R goes on increasing, I keep this section the same. If I went on increasing R, what is happening? The GMR is going on increasing. So, in principle, I must do I must do better with the same GM, correct? So, in the limit, what uh, what do you expect? If R tends to infinity, right? It is of course I uh, you know we must understand that as R tends to the unity gain frequency of the integrator is going on. As R goes becomes larger and larger, what happens to the unity gain frequency? What is the unity gain frequency? 1 by RC. So, the unity we all grant that the unity gain frequency is going on decreasing, 
but what I am trying to point out is that as R goes on increasing for a fixed transconductor, the integrated tends to become more and more and more ideal because that, that extra factor 1 divided by 1 plus 1 by GMR starts to tend to 1, right. So, in fact, if R tends to infinity, I mean, uh, you know, this within quotes becomes as good as an ideal integrator. I mean, of course, we agree that the unity gain frequency is very, very low, correct. So, whatever integrator you build, right, if you set R equal to infinity, right, it must approach ideal behavior, correct, because the unity gain frequency of the integrator you are trying to realize is very, is so low that even if the op amp kind of gives up at a lower frequency, you are still okay, you understand, all right. So, let us use that intuition here. So, as R tends to infinity, what happens? This is what happens, correct. So, does this ring a bell? How many poles are there, first of all, in this network? One pole, two poles, three poles. Dinesh Jayaraman, how many poles do you think are there here? Two, why? If there are two poles, it means that there are two independent capacitors, that is correct, but not the other way around, right. There seem to be three capacitors, as far as I can see the three capacitors. That is correct, man. If there are two poles, it means there are two independent state variables. That is all correct, but that does not explain why there are two poles in this circuit. Sir, uh, one, one is uh, virtually grounded. So what is virtual ground? GM1 why is this virtual ground? The argument was that this is virtual ground. I mean, that is not correct. Okay. So, I mean, what happens to this? Uh, once there is a voltage on that capacitor, what? where does that? Is there anything happening to that capacitor at voltage at all? What is happening to that voltage? What is that capacitor doing? See. If you have a capacitor and you are not drawing current from it, what does it behave like? Battery, right? So, if the initial condition is 0, basically what is this capacitor doing to the whole network? What happens if, if this voltage goes up by V, what happens to this voltage? It also goes up by V regardless of the value of the capacitor. So, this capacitor cannot come into the pole 0 equations at all. Does it make sense? Right? So, as far as this I mean as far as the network is, this particular network is concerned, when R tends to infinity, it is as good as having this, right. And now can you look at it and tell me if there is some problem? Does this not strike a bell at all? So, how, what does this remind you of? It, it reminds you of a gyrator, two integrators in a in a feedback loop, correct. So, this will in principle oscillate, I mean we will have poles at, come on people respond, on the j omega axis and where on the j omega axis will the poles lie? Okay, so this will have poles at omega naught square root of gm1, gm2 by cp1, cp2. Correct? Okay. Now some of you may argue that, hey, look, in reality there is a. I mean, all this we got by saying r tends to infinity correct. So, but in reality there is going to be some r, correct. So, but what do you think, I mean if r becomes very, very large, 
what is it equivalent to? Yeah, I know it is an open circuit, but having R adds damping, is not it? Right. So, what can you say about the damping factor as R becomes larger and larger? The damping factor reduces, so the Q of these poles increases. So, strictly one can argue that the Q is not infinite, but but the poles are on the in the left half plane. But as you can see, as R becomes smaller and smaller, the I mean larger and larger, the Q becomes so high, which means that if you uh, ideally if you whack an integrator with a step, you must get a ramp at the output, correct. Now, if I took this built an integrator like this and whacked it with a step, what do you think I will get? I mean you will expect to see huge ringing at, at this frequency, correct. Because there are poles at that frequency, you excite any system with poles, right, unless there is some magical cancellation happening, happening, you will see in any response, step response, impulse response, ramp response, you will see components corresponding to the complex frequencies of that pole. And since these poles on the J omega axis, the quality factor of those poles is infinite, which means that their impulse response lasts for ever, correct. So, any response that you see, you will see the complex frequencies corresponding to these poles, you know, appear and that is clearly not what you want, right. So, in practice, you know, these GMs will have extra poles themselves, which uh, will mean that this structure will actually be unstable, you understand. All right. So, what do you think, uh, what do you suggest uh, we do to fix this problem? Okay. So, then the idea is, okay, we know, I mean, we understand that this is an undamped system, right. So, let us go back to our schematic where R was, was uh, infinity and uh, let us see what we can do to fix this, right. It will now make it, you know, whatever you would increase the da damping factor, make this system a well damped system, so that you have a chance of making. I mean, ideally where do you want, what do you, I mean, we of course want a well damped system, but what can you say about omega naught? Would you want a very high omega naught or a very low omega naught? I mean, if it is not high, it must be low or vice versa. What does oscillation have to do with frequency? And we all agree that the damping factor must be large, correct. Now, the question is what you must have for omega naught? You want omega naught to be as high as possible. I mean, the omega naught are all extra poles that appear, you know, in the so called integrated transfer function. Ideally, the integrator must have only one pole at, at the origin. And where is that pole coming from? It is coming from the feedback capacitor and the, the resistor which we have removed from the schematic, right. So, this part of the circuit is only responsible for, you know, extra poles which ideally should not be there, which is equivalent to saying that in practice you want to make these poles as high frequency as possible, right. So, always you must aim to make this omega naught as large as possible. All right, and of course we want some damping. All right. Now there are several ways of introducing damping. Correct. What do you think uh, are uh, ways of introducing damping in this structure? Okay. So technique one. You see some capacitor. You put a big resistor. I mean, you put a small resistor across it in parallel. Right. That seems like. Okay. So, what is the problem with this technique? So, the uh, the equivalent transconductance, right, is now also, if you want, you know, uh, what do you call to damp it effectively, this resistor, the damping resistor, must it be small or must it be large? It must be small. If you want this to be small, Right. 
the gain of the first stage will be small right so for example if i choose rd to be equal to 1 by gm1 just as an illustration right then uh, if rd is 1 by gm1 then the composite gm is now approximately gm1 times rd which is approximately 1 times gm2 divided by 1 plus s cp1 rd okay so this character here is 1 so this will be approximately gm2 by 1 plus s cp1 rd so not only i mean by damping it this way we find that the effective transconductance from here to here has been dramatically reduced right i mean now if somebody looks at this uh, what is the most obvious engineering argument one can say one can use yes forget about why have gm1 and all that just get rid of it and then have just gm2 and live with it right that seems a lot smarter way of doing it than you know creating this loop and then putting the damping resistor so this way of damping is not particularly is not a great way of doing it so uh, all right so that idea doesn't work what else do you think what is the next thing you can do all right so then uh, one might say hey how about uh, uh, putting a resistor in series with cp1 correct i mean that's another way of damping the damping the network you have to make the capacitors lossy right now uh, there is a practical problem to that what are the cps the parasitic capacitors to ground right so there is absolutely no control right so you cannot say i will cut i will cut this wire and then put a resistor in series that is absolutely not possible okay then the next argument could be going by the same going by the same line of thought that we had earlier what do you think uh, uh, you could do you tried putting a resistor across cp1 did not work out what else across cp2 it seems like seems like another idea but that also is fraught with the same disadvantages or dangers as what we got in with cp1 right so this doesn't work either all right so what else do you think uh, we could do one suggestion is put a resistor put a capacitor resistor there okay put a resistor here okay so a resistor in series with the current source what does it do yeah putting i mean putting a resistor in series with the current source or a resistor in parallel with a voltage source both do both do nothing correct so that doesn't work either right another somewhat non obvious idea is to say i'm going to put a resistor here right which is equivalent to putting a resistor across cp2 right but uh, and as we discussed doing this directly while this damps the loop right this is uh, you know whatever right this uh, this will go and kill the gain however if I implemented this resistor as a transconductor right this is nothing but this is 1 by gm correct this is a transconductor 
Now, if instead of injecting this current here, if I injected this current there, this is the same thing, same diagram. Let me replay the whole thing, right? Resistor here damps the loop. You all agree? This is nothing but a trans conductor with the output connected to itself, to the input, correct? This damps the loop. We all agree? All right. Now, this is the same thing. Instead of, I realize that this wire and this wire are the are the same. So, in principle, I could do this, correct? All right. And please recall that in the actual integrator, there is a capacitance there, right? So, as far as the GM is concerned, what is the GM now? Okay. So, it is basically G M 1 by S C P 1 times G M, I am sorry. So, G M 1 G M 2 by S C P 1 plus G M 2, correct? Sorry, it is plus G M 3, all right? And so, what is the loop gain? If I yank this voltage up and measure this voltage, what is the loop gain? The whole thing into 1 by SCP 2, correct? So, what is the GM at low frequency or rather what is the gain of this, uh, this thing at low frequency? GM1, GM2 by SCP1, SCP2. So, this will be at DC, it will be infinity and it will fall off at 40 dB per decade, correct? And where will it go to unity? It will go to unity at omega naught, which is nothing but square root of G M 1, G M 2 by C P 1, C P 2, okay, all right. And uh, what is G M 3 by S C P 2, how will that look like? Depending on the value of G M 3, right, it can be, if G M 3 is very high, it can be like this, right. And what is this frequency be? No root of C P 2, correct? So, now each of the individual parts looks like this. So, what will the sum of the two look like? The, the sum of the two will look like this. You understand? Okay. So, at low frequency, what are you getting? Where is most of the contribution of this transconductor coming from? It is coming from GM1, GM2, right? At high frequency, what is happening? What is happening is that it looks like this. all the contribution is coming from GM3 by CP2. So, what do you think? Uh, so, all of you are now familiar with phase margin, right? So, if this is the loop gain function, okay, uh, what can you say about the, I mean, uh, the what is the relevant phase that you are looking for? At the unity gain crossover, you are interested in the phase. So, if for this particular diagram, right, at unity gain, we see that the contribution of the transfer function of the loop gain is, is largely coming from GM3 by CP2, right? So, the contribution from the second order uh, stuff is, is much smaller, which means therefore that 
the phase must be almost 90 degrees, correct? All right. So, this means that angle of the loop gain function is approximately minus 90 degrees. So, as far as stability calculations are concerned, this pretty much looks like a first order system, right? All right. So, but once you put the integrating capacitor, we see that all that I mean you can interpret G M 3 as being a damping resistor of value 1 by G M 3, correct? You understand because at, at uh, I mean if, if R tends to infinity, the input, input integrating resistor tends to infinity, this will become a short circuit which means that GM3 is closed on itself, which means that it behaves like a resistor of value 1 by GM3 and uh, you know if you choose GM3 properly, then this damping factor, I mean this effectively is damping the loop, right. This is one way of introducing damping, okay. So this, if you think about this structure, there are many ways of interpreting this, okay. One way is to say, hey, I had earlier I had only, let us say I started off with a first order, I mean a, a single stage transconductor, correct. A single stage transconductor we know for all, I mean for all values of GM3, the system will be stable. It is only that we do not have sufficient transconductance at, I mean please note that I mean the filter transfer function my you know is, is probably much smaller than the unity gain frequency of the integrator, correct. So, the problem with the first order character is that there is not enough transconductance at low frequencies, right. Now, then we say okay, if I get rid of this guy, but have only the second order guy, right. The transconductance is very high at low frequency, but because of the two poles that it introduces, the loop gain function has got so much extra phase. In other words, it takes a long time for, there is a lot of phase delay. What does it mean? It means that if I yank the input, it takes a long time for the for information to reach the output, right. And whenever you have a feedback loop, if there is a lot of delay in the feedback loop, it, it means that the system is likely to be unstable, right. Now, this is a way of putting together the advantages of both the first order system, the, uh, the uh, single stage transconductor and the two stage transconductor, right. The single stage transconductor gives you this, uh, uh, you know, basically the gain of this character. I mean, in other words, you can see that if I suddenly yank this node up, what happens to, I mean, how is this, uh, what is this current and what is this current? If let us say I put a step here in voltage, right, let us neglect this capacitor for the time being. If I put a step here, what is I1 and what is I2? The moment I increase, yank this up, right, this, this current will be GM1 times I1, correct. But this is a capacitor, so its voltage cannot change instantaneously, which means that GM2 will not be able to supply any current, all right. On the other hand, GM3 is supplying I2 straight away, right. So, GM3 provides the fast within quotes sloppy current, right, because the correction is only the maximum correction is only capable of giving is only GM3 times whatever step I put, right. Whereas, this cascaded path is the, the larger, more accurate. I mean, this guy really administers a big kick, right? If the uh, if the input node jumps, okay, but that takes a a while to come. You understand? So, if you had only left it to this character without the single stage between the input and output, the loop would be unstable because this correction comes too late. 
right i mean an example is is uh, of uh, you know for example let's say you had courses and then you never had any quizzes at all right you only had the nsem and you had no evaluation during the course you don't really know whether you understood or you don't whether you've been putting in enough hard work or uh, you're understanding stuff properly right so quizzes which are basically 10 marks 15 marks or whatever they are now right are quick feedback i mean you know it's obviously not possible to test you on the entire syllabus uh, in a quiz right but you know whatever we have done so far okay let me try and test you i understand that it is course feedback right but it is you know it is quick of course uh, which is also why uh, it's important to return the quiz papers quickly right it doesn't make sense to conduct the quiz and not give you the papers at all until the end is over again right because there's no there's no feedback correct all right so the idea in having these small quick quizzes is to give you feedback as to what's happening right and the end sum is the the slow but more accurate feedback stuff right so where you know you actually test people more thoroughly you have a you know whatever 3 hour, 3 hour exam and, and all this wonderful stuff right so that is the the uh, the fast uh, the slow but accurate feedback and this is the fast one right so as you can if you can kind of uh, recall something from your feedback classes this as you can see is an example of having two paths one slow path and one fast path okay so this is an example of what is called a feed forward compensated structure you have to choose gm3 sufficiently large correct okay which is also evident from the bode plot right so this is 0 db as you all know now if gm3 becomes too small what do you think will happen right if gm3 is too small what will happen is that this line will come let's say it's like this okay so this is gm3 being too small you understand and that is uh, you know this is a problem now because it's almost like having at all frequencies as you can see now the contribution of the this the first order stage is much smaller than the contribution from the second order stage so for what for all practical purposes we see that the response is it's almost like not having gm3 at all right which means that you have the same old problem that you had earlier does it make sense all right okay now uh, and please recall that 1 over gm3 represents the damping factor i mean you know is is the damping resistor of the closed loop system so this is so this when you you know package it in a box and make it fully differential and put common mode feedback and all that right here clearly you will need two common mode feedback loops why you need to stabilize the output common mode of gm1 and the output common mode of gm2 so you need two common mode feedback loops right and uh, so you can package this into a fully differential structure right where uh, the compensation is so called the so called feed forward compensation right and as you can see if gm is chosen properly the unity gain frequency can be of the loop, i mean uh, the unity gain unity loop gain frequency can be higher or should be higher than square root of gm1 gm2 divided by cp1 cp2 i mean this 
must be much larger than this only then the system will be stable and please remember that for any negative feedback loop to be stable at the unity gain crossover of the magnitude response the slope must be as close to minus 20 db per decade right so in other words uh, at high frequencies this system must look like a first order system all right uh, all right now another way of introducing damping without using an additional transconductor is any ideas okay so i mean one way of thinking about it is that at high frequency i mean the reason why this structure is unstable is because at high frequency i mean ideally if i, bro I broke the loop here if I yanked this guy up, what is happening here is what I am actually getting is uh, here I will be getting a ramp voltage, right? And the voltage here is going to be an integral of a ramp, right? Whereas if I had a simply, if I if I had truly first order behavior, then I should get a I should get a ramp at the output, correct? So, one way of saying, hey, uh, so in other words, if I somehow implemented here not only something proportional to S square, but something proportional to S, right, the system would be stable provided I choose these coefficients properly, which is basically what the additional transconductor is also doing. Please note that 1 by s path earlier in the feed forward structure was coming from gm3. But then one could take the view that hey look I already have something proportional to 1 by s here. So the question is do I need to use a extra transconductor to generate the first order stuff or can I use some passive elements to generate a first order system at this point, correct? So what do you think I can do? So one thing that could be done is that I put a capacitor like this, right? And now what happens? So, so in other words, if I yank this character up, right? The I mean, what happens to this voltage? With what ratio? What happens if I yank this voltage up, if this loop is broken, this will go up by CC by CC plus CP2, right? Okay. Another way of looking at it is this wire and this wire are the same. So if I add CC here or CC here, right? I mean, does it make any? Does it make any difference? All right. Okay. So if I, uh, what happens here?
yeah i guess it's not very it's not very apparent what's happening yeah i just leave it at that i thought you could all right so just let me leave it like this okay so the job of so bottom line is does cc have to be very large or very small to get effective damping one would think that cc would have to be large right because if cc is small it's like having cc equal to 0 and we know that we are in trouble right and intuitively it makes sense because if cc is large then if i yank this this also the portion of that high frequency uh, content reaching the output will be higher if cc is large does it make sense and does this remind you of something so if i remove this this is the effective transconductor correct and what is this reminding you of this is the standard miller compensating capacitor right so you have this is a miller compensator op amp yes uh for high frequency yes no no see at 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 uh, all that we need is for dc dc negative feedback as frequency increases the phase difference goes on is no longer zero i mean what or the loop gain is no longer 180 degrees it's going on changing right so this uh, this uh, uh, the only thing you can ensure is that at dc the, there is negative feedback as frequency goes on increasing the phase difference goes on changing so it's not clear what is the meaning of negative feedback because the phase difference is no longer 180 degrees if the system is close to being unstable then at the loop, I mean, at dc the loop gain is has 180 degrees but around the unity gain for crossover frequency the the phase margin is very small which is equivalent to saying that the phase has gone to almost to zero which means what was originally negative feedback is actually becoming positive feedback. All right. Now, if I took this and uh, so this is GM one, right? So uh, if GM two is very large, okay. What do you think is the unity gain frequency of uh, of uh, this op amp? So if GM2 is uh, tends to infinity, then the unity gain frequency is nothing but GM1 by CC. Okay. And uh, so, I mean, of course, now the analysis becomes a lot more complicated in the sense that there are several capacitors, and uh, uh, right. So I'll carry out. Yeah. If GM2 tends to infinity, it will not. Right. And the intuition behind that is, if GM2 tends to infinity, then so the negative feedback will cause the output impedance to become zero at all and then the, it will immediately charge up cp2 and so on so it's not real yet pardon no no this is the omega u of the op amp not the integrator right unity gain right can you comment on the swing of the structure when implemented in CMOS? I mean, how do you realize this? An example is you have two transconductors cascaded. So, how many common mode feedback loops will you need? Two. So, you need VCM FB1, which will hold 
this output common mode properly and then you need another common source amplifier which senses the output of this guy and so there are two possible common source amplifiers there are two uh, common source amplifiers you know one is the nmos and one is the pmos do you think it makes sense to use the nmos or the pmos structures here so when i this has to be followed by another transconductor stage right that stage has to be a common source amplifier right because you want you want a large gn okay so now that can be either a common uh, source pmos amplifier or a common source nmos amplifier what do you think makes sense to use here why okay so as we have seen before this is exactly the same as what you saw it's a fully differential version of what you saw in the two stage op amp discussion in the earlier classes right and you need another Yeah, so in principle it is yeah, so what is pointing out is why do you need two common mode feedback loops uh, for his idea is if I instead of having separate common mode feedback loops if I had if I detected the output common mode and just yanked this guy right is perhaps not very apparent here I will discuss this in the next class okay.